Hi, everybody. My name is John Robinson. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. And I want to talk to you today about uh, what we call regenerative sustainability. Uh, in other words, uh, achieving net positive outcomes uh, in both human and environmental terms. You've been hearing a lot today already about net zero and some of the incredible work that's gone on in the city of Toronto from Devin and David. Uh, and you've heard this kind of overall framing uh, from Alex, uh, all uh, oriented towards the idea of net zero, <clears throat> which has become kind of the uh, ambitious target of, of many cities around the world and many uh, government uh, governments around the world at different levels. What I want to talk about is going <clears throat> beyond net zero energy. Uh, so going beyond both net zero and going beyond energy as well. And I want to start with the kind of cultural narrative about sustainability that we've all been exposed to. And uh, pretty much uh, all of you have heard almost from birth. And this is a storyline that is about um, constraints and limits. It's about uh, exceeding uh, boundaries and limits and therefore the need for uh, strategies of harm reduction, of damage limitation, of mitigation, of cutting back. Often the language is explicitly uh, expressed in the context of sacrifice. So uh, we have to reduce, basically. And uh, one example of this, a famous example invented by my friend Bill Reese at UBC um, and his PhD student Matisse Bachernangel, uh, is the ecological footprint, which you've all heard about. Uh, we're currently somewhere in the order of 1.5 to 2, uh, consuming the, the product of 1.5 to 2 planets already. So we're exceeding our one planet carrying capacity. And we're heading in the wrong direction towards greater uh, ecological footprints. And what we have to do, of course, is, is reduce, is to cut back um, uh, and, uh, and get us to uh, one, what some people have called one planet living. Of course, there are indeed limits and boundaries at multiple scales from a sustainability point of view, and not all of them are environmental. Um, uh, you could think of a stream or a river exceeding its carrying capacity. Uh, you can think of resource dependent communities being lost when the resources run out. Um, the subprime mortgage disaster in the US was an example of a limit, reaching some serious limits in terms of the, uh, of the financial system, especially uh, in the United States. Um, and we're all very aware of increasing incidents of floods, fires, and droughts around the world where uh, certain kinds of uh, ecological uh, constraints and limits are, are, are being. Uh, exceeded. And on the uh, diagram here, you can see on the left, the famous planetary boundaries uh, concept that there are these nine areas where we uh, need to stay within planetary limits. So this is a very powerful and very prevalent discourse. You've all been exposed to it uh, for many years. Um, I want to just mention or briefly touch on what we might think of are the consequences of this um, way of thinking about sustainability. And uh, to do that, I'm going to show you a little excerpt that came from a newsletter from that my son's school back in the 1990s when they were uh, young. They went to school and this was a newsletter that was produced by the students. So every uh, part of it was written by the students. And this is a little excerpt uh, written by Rachel, who was 12 years old at the time. Um, and this is in uh, the fall of, of 1995. A very, very long time ago, there was a beautiful world. The world was covered with beautiful trees, plants, and especially flowers. All the animals that lived there were happy. There were little fights, of course, but all in all, they were very happy. One day, something strange happened. Some new creatures were born. They were very peculiar. They were almost bald and weak. At first, the new creatures were okay, but slowly they became evil. After a long time, they became monsters. They ruined the world and killed the flowers and the plants. We killed the world. We are the monsters. 12 years old, 1995. Uh, this is well-meaning uh, information being provided by teachers, uh, concerned to make people aware of these, uh, these kinds of problems, these sustainability problems. And you were all exposed to that kind of information. You may have reacted the way Rachel did. 
the worry, of course, is that this kind of indoctrination into a, a particular cultural narrative as the kind of the real uh, expression of, uh, of, of what unsustainability means uh, can have significant consequences. And the two that worry me are apathy. I just throw up my hands. Uh, I can't deal with it. It's, it's, uh, uh, I'm too small. What can I do? And denial. This can't be true. It's just too disturbing. So as a cultural narrative, there's some problems uh, with thinking about sustainability as about harm reduction and damage limitation uh, or uh, aiming for net zero. It's, I think, not motivating, as I've been trying to suggest. People don't jump onto the bandwagon of sacrifice or leap to the forefront of the social movement of cutting back. This is a problem because we actually have to engage the whole population of the planet in sustainability issues. It's not gonna be solved by a handful of people in a handful of countries. It's gonna need deep engagement. So we need the narrative to be motivating. It doesn't go far enough. Net zero is not uh, far enough. We have to go, we have to regenerate, we have to replenish, we have to restore, we have to go beyond net zero uh, outcomes. It's as typically expressed, it's primarily environmental. Um, and in fact, in this context we're talking about, it's almost always uh, energy, net zero energy. But sustainability, as we know, is about both environmental and human well being. It's a little too scientific in the sense that it suggests a technical response is the way we can address these problems. Uh, I think that's a bit naive. There are huge human, social, political, uh, philosophical, et cetera, dimensions uh, of value and meaning that have to be uh, explicitly part of this. So uh, my argument is we need a different story. And what I wanna do is give you a brief outline of one such alternative, uh, which we call regenerative sustainability, which we define as human activity that doesn't have to be minimized because it's so damaging, that human activity that simultaneously increases human and environmental well-being. So two crucial characteristics of this approach, it's not just environmental, sustainability is not just an environmental issue, it has huge social, cultural, economic, political, et cetera, dimensions. Um, and it's about being net positive, not just net zero. It's about making things better, not just less bad. This is quite consistent, the first part of this with um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which as you know, go far beyond environmental issues. Uh, when you look at number one, it's no poverty. So uh, this approach uh, of both human and environmental uh, is consistent with the UN SDGs. It's also consistent with approaches such as the famous cradle to cradle and upcycle arguments of uh, Will, Bill, McDonough and Michael Brongard, you can see in this graph on the right that you both want to reduce over time the red, the bads, the negatives, and you want to create positive outcomes. My favorite version of this uh, kind of concept is by John Ehrenfeld. Uh, this is a book back in 2008 where he says, I define sustainability as the possibility that humans and other life will flourish on the earth forever. Flourishing is the metaphor that brings life to this definition of sustainability and enables everybody to create their own image of what their flourishing world would be. Flourishing is technically an emergent property of a complex living system. Such properties like beauty always emerge within the context of the observers or actors in the system and take on characteristics determined by that context. Sustainability is only a powerful vision humans can use individually and collectively to design the world in which they live and act so that the possibility of flourishing is never closed off. I think it's a powerful narrative. It has deep resonance, strong metaphorical presence, but it also connects to crucial issues like complexity and emergence. So, that's kind of the overall framework, but what I want to mainly do today with you is give you some examples of how this kind of net positive human and environmental perspective can play out. And so you see across the bottom the, the five examples I want to give uh, a little bit of, about Kellenborg, uh, about uh, Velux, the active house idea, the Evolve One building, and, uh, and the SERS building. 
So be, long before the term circular economy became popular, um, there was the concept of industrial ecology or industrial symbiosis. This is back in the 1990s. And in Denmark, there was an industrial park uh, at Kallenborg um, that uh, implemented this and for a while was a, a pretty famous poster child for what we now call the circular economy uh, or biomimicry approaches, industrial ecology and so on. Um, and what uh, Kallenborg was, was uh, and this is a picture of it in the 1990s, was 12 companies that got together. The, the myth is, uh, the story is they all, uh, some of the CEOs met at a golf uh, club one day and said, why don't we think about how we could interact with each other? Maybe your waste products could be my inputs. And so they got together and they set up a system for exchanging three kinds of materials, energy, water, and, and material, so, so three kinds of substances, um, uh, among their 12 companies. And you can see this is how things looked in the 1990s. And you see the flows uh, of the different colors that represent different uh, types of substance being transferred. Here it is in 2015, still going strong, uh, but two crucial, well, a, a couple of interesting things. First of all, you see many different kinds of things being uh, moved around. Uh, for example, 12 different kinds of water. Who knew there were 12 different kinds of water, but it matters a lot when you're taking this in that it correspond, whether it's technical water or cooling water or deionized water or seawater, et cetera. Um, the second thing is notice that the flows have really grown. There's way more things being transferred, um, uh, 13 kinds of materials, five kinds of energy, 12 kinds of water. But the third thing is the most interesting, I think. Turns out only six of the companies that were doing this in the 1990s are still part of it in 2015. One of the big problems with this kind of industrial symbiosis is the problem of lock-in. What if you, you're dependent on another co company for inputs and, uh, and they go to business? But this is an interesting example where six did leave and six new ones came on and still the system functions and indeed functions even better than before. So this is kind of a cool example of decades of uh, circular economy process that really uh, represents a kind of regenerative idea that these wastes are not something to be minimized necessarily. They may actually be positive benefits to another organization. <clears throat> Turning to Velux, Velux is a, a Danish company um, and they make roof windows. They're a big company, uh, transnational company. And you can see on the right, the sort of standard kind of roof windows that they produce. But my favorite ones are the ones shown on the left here. As you can see, they can be flat, in which case they're like a window. But if you look in the middle, you see you can push the bottom up and raise the top up and you got a little balcony there. So it's quite a cool example of uh, multi-use technology. Um, however, Velux, uh, uh, well, that does not actually market roof windows. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But first say that they started back in 2016 to develop a focus on uh, healthy homes uh, as part of their, uh, their business model. And so they de developed this European survey in 2016 called the Healthy Homes Barometer. And then every year they'd publish another document. Uh, this one was about impact on Europeans' uh, health. Uh, this was on unhealthy homes offices and suburbanization, the health implications of that. This one was about children growing up in unhealthy buildings, that is schools uh, and homes that uh, were unhealthy. Uh, in 2020, it was about green recovery and post-COVID. Um, there wasn't one in 2021, and, but in 2022, it's ab about resilience, sustainable buildings and resilience. So the whole focus of Velux has been on increasingly on this idea of human well-being. And they've developed a model uh, based on some German research originally of what it takes to make a healthy home. And the five factors are daylight, sleeping conditions, temperature, fresh air, and humidity. Um, and I point this out, not, not all of these quite work uh, in the context of the project we're talking about, especially the good sleeping conditions, uh, although maybe there'll be some couches uh, somewhere in there where people will uh, end up sleeping on. 
but simply to point out that this just takes us quite a ways from the technical parameters of the windows uh, into uh, the, uh, the well-being implications of, of that technology. Uh, so they don't, they market healthy homes. You still buy a roof window when you leave the showroom, but they're not, they're not marketing in terms of those uh, technical characteristics so much as in terms of this larger idea of improving human well-being. Now, uh, Valix was one of the originators of my next example, which is Active House, which you may have heard of. You've, uh, of course, all heard of Passive House, and Passive House is incredibly powerful. It's kind of a one-trick pony in a sense, because it's all about the envelope, um, and it's about heat loss. And that's, as you heard from Alex, that's, that's absolutely crucial. Uh, it can't get anywhere if you don't pay a lot of attention to that. Active House says, okay, let's start with the Passive House uh, concept and then uh, make it active, go beyond uh, the uh, heat loss, go beyond energy. You can see a whole bunch of national alliances here and companies and organizations. There's three Canadian partners. There's an Active House Canada organization, Great Gulf, the developers um, uh, built the first registered Active House in the world uh, and, and they're a part of this system. And then the Daniels faculty, I think this is mainly Ted Kessick, uh, is involved with Active House as well. The three characteristics of Active Houses are comfort, environment, and energy. And look on the right and you'll see this net positive focus, healthier and more comfortable place, net positive. Contributes positively to the energy balance, net positive. Has a positive impact on the environment, net positive, beyond net zero. There's a this was as of 2019, I haven't seen more recent uh, information. There's about a hundred of them around the world. So these are very early stage of the development of, the, of this uh, approach uh, in 23 countries, uh, 20 of the hundred have been uh, fully labeled. And the first certified active house in the world is in Etobicoke uh, here. Um, it was built uh, by Great Gulf as one of the houses in their and in a development in Centennial Park in Etobicoke, you can see the exterior of the house in the top right. You can see the Valix roof windows in the, to, to the far right. And then you can see the interior. Um, I've had a tour of this. They had an engineer of the company uh, live there with his family for six months and blog about it. There's all kinds of information about their experience. Um, so I've had a tour of it and it's incredible. Uh, I'll, one feature I'll point out to you on the left here you see behind the glazing there a tree. That glazing is around all three sides of the tree on both floors. You can see in the top floor, uh, but you, uh, it, 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 in, in a sense, it's a cutout in the floor plan of the building uh, where this tree is planted. It's the house tree. When I was there, the, uh, the parents uh, of the kids uh, said their, their children kept going out and watering the house tree and they kept measuring its growth over time. So there's this sense of engagement uh, with the natural world uh, being embedded in the design of the, of the house itself. Um, moving on to Evolve One. Evolve One is a commercial office building in Waterloo, Ontario. Um, built by the Cora Group. What's interesting about this is it's not a government building and it's not a university building. It's not public sector, it's private sector. Um, uh, and so this is an, uh, a rendering, <laughs> artist's rendering of what the building would look like. But sometimes those renderings aren't very accurate. Uh, so I've included a picture of uh, the actual building which opened its doors uh, in 2018. And the interesting thing about this building uh, is that it was designed to be net positive in energy terms from the beginning. Stantec was the sustainability consultant and the mechanical, as I recall, consultant. And uh, that was built in from the beginning. Sustainable Waterloo Region was very involved in the discussions. I remember giving a talk on some stuff there. There were all these partners from the community involved, uh, but a, a market building aimed at the commercial marketplace a class A office space uh, to be net positive in energy. And you can see some of the sustainability features. They're very standard. You've been hearing about them all morning today. Uh, these kinds of things are what are typical. 
That building was the first project to receive a zero carbon building design certification under Green Buildings Council Zero Carbon Building Standard, which you heard about this morning as well. Um, <clears throat> so not net positive in carbon, but a net zero in carbon. And if you look at their marketing, what's interesting to me is their list of amenities includes uh, uh, five that are um, environmental and seven that are social or human. So they're focusing on both sides of the sustainability equation. Okay, I wanna spend a minute or two talking about a building we built uh, at the University of British Columbia, uh, which opened its doors in 2011. So it's 11 years ago, uh, this building opened. Uh, it's called the Center for Interactive Research on Sustainability. Um, and I wanna just say something about goal setting. You heard Alex talk a lot about that and give you some really good advice uh, about, about goals. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the process of goal setting. Uh, you, you have to do it, it's all compressed into a week, but for most big building projects, that process itself can take time and is important. We started with an elevator talk that serves would be green, humane, and smart. Green meaning net positive impact on ecosystem health. So the building, building the building would improve the environment in which it sits. Humane made, meant the same thing for people, continuously improve the health, productivity, and happiness of the inhabitants. Health, productivity, and happiness. Um, and smart meant not just smart in the IT sense, but smart in the economic sense, uh, that it was affordable uh, and smart in the sense of learning, being a living lab where we would learn. So we turned those 10, uh, or those three, sorry, goals, overall goals, into 22 design goals. Uh, so uh, just kind of disaggregate those goals and we ended up with 22. We then had a series of charrettes and turned those 22 goals into 151 strategies. Um, so that was pretty complex to hand over to the design team, 151 strategies. We did hand it over, but we also aggregated it back up to 10 design principles organized in terms of our three categories. So five environmental design principles, three social or human design principles, and two uh, smart design principles. Um, and uh, we were told we did a lot of interviewing of the design team over the process of this uh, building uh, uh, design and, and construction and operation. And we were told this was the lighthouse, that when difficult trade-offs had to be made, uh, they would turn back to these design principles as guidance for how to make those decisions. As you may know, the real, uh, the, the real horror story of sustainability in buildings is uh, the, the dreaded value engineering stage when suddenly uh, you have to cut the budget substantially. And so what gets cut is everything that's sort of extraneous, everything that isn't core to the very design of the building itself is a candidate for being cut. A lot of the sustainability features uh, are like that. So a, a big part of the purpose of the exercise has to be to build those design features, uh, design goals deeply into the very uh, guts and core of, of the building design. Um, uh, so they're less vulnerable to being cut at the value engineering stage. So starting with the elevator top, you can see we gradually got more and more complex and then got again more simple. Um, and, but we couldn't have started with these 10. We had to go through that process. Here's a, a diagram of many of the features. Don't worry about that. I just, I'm using this to say uh, that we turned the, the goals uh, into seven uh, net positive goals. We want to be net positive on energy, operational carbon, water quality, and structural carbon. You've heard a lot about structural carbon today. We were very, well, we did LCA of the building. This was back in 2008 or so. Um, and then three human um, net positive targets. Let's have a building that makes people healthier, more productive and happier. And it's crucial to have both, I think. Uh, it's not enough to just have the net positive. That's already a big step, net positive environmental targets. But I think you really need these human ones and partly for reasons I'll tell you about in a minute. 
And then let's make the whole thing a living lab over its whole lifetime, studying it. There's been dozens of PhD dissertations and postdoc uh, uh, and uh, master's theses and so on on the SIRS building. So, um, sorry. To put this in, in sort of more approachable terms for many of our uh, m many of the stakeholders that we were working with, here's how we interpreted net positive in environmental terms. Let's get all water from the sky and treat all liquid waste on site. So full sewage treatment on site, that'll make us net positive on water quality. Let's get all heating and cooling from the ground, from the neighbors or from the sun, all light, uh, daylighting uh, and uh, when available uh, and green electricity and uh, as much natural ventilation as possible. That'll make us net positive on energy and GHG emissions. A wood building will help us to become net positive on structural carbon. So if we do all that, we'll have a building that actually restores the environment around it, not just reduces harm, actually makes things better. And then let's make sure it's a living lab. Let's continuously study the technical performance and the behavioral interface. Um, that's crucial as well. I'm not gonna go through the environmental performance very much, I don't have time. Uh, just to make a quick point here, the, the red bar is, was typical kilowatt hours per square meter per year for office buildings. This was an office building in Vancouver at the time. Uh, you can see how that's really high and you've already seen proposals by Alex to be down in the below 100 range for the uh, TEUI. So, um, you know, the typical was two and a half times, three times as, as high. Um, our goal was to get down to 40% of that, a 60% reduction. What we actually achieved is the green bar, which is a 50% reduction. You can decide whether this is failure or success. It's 50% better than typical buildings at the time, but it's 25% worse than the design. It was 50 instead of 40% uh, of the reference. Um, so you, you make, can make up your mind about that. I really want to turn more to the human side because this has got less attention so far today and I think it's pretty crucial. Uh, how, what does it mean to be regenerative in human terms for a building project? Well, to us, it partly meant allowing people to shift from being occupants uh, here on the left, which we defined as passive recipients of building systems. You can maybe open your window, you can turn on the lights, maybe. And that's about it. You don't know how the building's heated or cooled. You're not engaged with it. Nobody's ever told you what controls are available to you and so on. And could you instead be an inhabitant over here on the right, which uh, who has a sense of place in and engagement with the building itself. And we thought our hypothesis was if we can enable people to be inhabitants, uh, we can create net positive outcomes in terms of health, productivity and happiness. Here's the kinds of things we built into the SERS building in order to try and enable in, inhabitancy, uh, very high air quality, individual control over ventilation, good acoustic performance. As you may know, that's the Achilles heel of a lot of uh, uh, high performing buildings is acoustics, daylighting everywhere, operable windows, web-based lighting controls, real-time performance data, ability to vote on control strategies for the building, wood frame and building with rooftop green space, sustainable food services. This is crucial, I think. It's absolutely crucial. People really care about food. If you provide a very highly sustainable food service outlet, that will be a huge pedagogical aid and very popular. In the SERS building, uh, people would come from around campus because it was such a great food service outlet. Social meeting spaces, information and discussion forums, we didn't manage to do all of them. The, one in, the ones in green, we were in there in the first, from the beginning, but some of them we didn't do. Uh, we, we did a little later, the yellow, and some we didn't do at all for a whole set of reasons I don't have time to go into. Uh, but again, this suggests you gotta be pretty ambitious in your goals because you may not quite realize them all. So what's the effect of this? This was a PhD dissertation done by Sylvia Coleman. Um, and she asked people, so this is self-reported human well-being, not so-called objective measures. Are you, what's your well-being uh, in terms of moving to SERS, the SERS building? What's it done to your well-being, your productivity, and your health? Uh, Red-ish is negative, blue is positive. You can see 
very positive results, especially in terms of overall well-being and health. Uh, with productivity, there were some people who said that it had diminishes our productivity, um, but it was still largely positive. Sylvia discovered a bunch of new practices that emerged out of the building. And I won't go through this list, but you can see a whole bunch of things started to happen. Nobody, nobody prompted this, nobody suggested this. These were things that emerged sort of organically from the way the SIRS building was organized and how it attempted to reach uh, these uh, human goals. Um, there are even behavioral consequences and people just passing through the building. This was a study done by the head of psychology at UBC, who actually, whose office was in SIRS. And uh, they discovered that the, the proper disposal, in other words, recycling uh, rate in uh, SIRS was much better than in the student union building with basically the same facilities. It wasn't about differences in attitudes, differences in values, differences in knowledge. It really seemed to be about awareness of being in a highly sustainable building. And there weren't a lot of signs. There was really only one sign, the name of the building that told them that, but nevertheless, it was clear walking through the building uh, that this was the focus. From the paper, people are significantly more likely to correctly choose the proper disposal bin in a building designed with sustainability in mind compared to a building that was not. This was an observational study. There was a subsequent experimental study. I don't have time to tell you about, but uh, basically the same result, yeah, even stronger, uh, was found in the subsequent study. Okay. Um, so I, I really would like to emphasize that it's crucial to pay attention to the human dimensions. It, they also connect quite a lot to what you're gonna be hearing about from David Maggs tomorrow, which is what about what's going on inside the building? And what about the role of the arts? The, uh, obviously the narrative of the building is, is, as I've been trying to suggest, crucial. That's something that is very deeply connected to, to the, uh, the role of the arts. But I wanna end with, just a couple of comments on performance gaps that I hope you can think about as you go through your process this week. Uh, here's a simple diagram where we have environmental systems uh, to human systems on one axis and pre-occupancy or pre-retrofit uh, on the left and post-retrofit on the right. Now, uh, in terms of the environmental systems, say energy, uh, we do modeling in the top left and we predict the performance. And then we, once the, the building, the retrofit is done or the building is built, we measure the performance. Um, on the human side, it's less common, but we can do pre-occupancy evaluation. It's in square brackets because it's so rare, uh, but we can ask people about their expectations of the building, their predictions, if you like, of, of, of what it will be like to live or work there. And then we do often do post-occupancy evaluation and say, what is the lived experience of that building? So pretty simple uh, two by two matrix here. Um, we can identify three performance gaps here. The first A is what we call the prediction gap. This is the famous gap that so many high performance buildings uh, do not live up to their predictions. That's the, the prediction gap. I'm not gonna say much about that. There's a huge literature on it. It's pretty well known what's going on there. I wanna point to the other two. The gap between what people expect their build this building to be after the retrofit and their actual lived experience in it, what we call the expectations gap. And we see an expectations gap um, in many buildings. And then C, the difference between the measured performance of something like air quality and the actual lived experience of air quality. And that's what we call the outcomes gaps, the outcomes gap when those aren't exactly the same. Sorry. Sylvia did a little more detailed work than in the previous uh, chart I showed you. Uh, when she looked at expectations about environmental performance, and you can see about the workspace, about temperature, light, green roof, electricity, uh, electrical lighting, control over environmental quality, air quality and movement acoustics. Um, and then social characteristics of the building, um, uh, supporting a sustainable lifestyle, stimulating creativity, having social opportunities for interaction, effects on well-being, on productivity and health, collaborative opportunities, beauty and inspiration. So there's a whole suite of, of measures. And as you can see, 
Uh, with SIRS, again, it's very largely positive. The most negative, not surprisingly, is acoustics on the environmental side. The second most negative is the green roof because it was locked and inaccessible for all kinds of reasons I don't have time to talk about. Uh, and then you see the same thing on the social side, but notice a difference. Both are positive, but the social is higher. This is really crucial. If we're going to achieve sustainability in buildings, we've got to pay a lot of attention to human well-being because that will impact people the most immediately. Uh, and it's actually easier in some ways to do that really well. So we get a lot of a good press, but support for the environmental sustainability features if we do the social sustainability features really well. So they should get a lot more attention than they typically have had in the past. Okay, I want to say just a word about the, the third performance gap, uh, the, the gap uh, between the measured performance of the building and the lived experience of the building. And I want to introduce an idea to you that I hope might be of some relevance as you're thinking through this. It, we call it interactive adaptivity. And this is the question of whether we can create a conversation between the inhabitants. Remember, we want inhabitants that are, have a sense of place in an engagement with the building. So we have all kinds of processes of engagement between those inhabitants and the building itself because both have goals. The building has goals, energy goals, carbon goals. You heard all about the goals. Alex suggested a bunch of goals for you, but people have goals too, about comfort, about interaction, maybe about beauty and uh, so on. How do we reconcile these two sets of goals? We think it's by creating a discussion between the building and the people in the building, enhanced communication and dialogue, that over time leads to mutually satisfactory outcomes because both sets of goals are important. So we don't want buildings as we built in the 1970s uh, that were so airtight that we had the sick building syndrome and everybody got sick. It was great for energy, uh, but it wasn't so good for human health. Um, so just you know, extending that uh, comparison into the present, we want to meet both sets of goals, but we need processes of engagement. One example, a kind of primitive example of this is what are known as built window signaling systems. This is from the Jim Pattison Center of Excellence in Penticton. And basically what you have is two lights here, uh, a green one or blue or turquoise, whatever color you think that is on the bottom and red. And when the green light is on, you're asked to open your windows. And when the red light is on, the building would like you to close your window. I think that's too primitive in two ways. First of all, it shouldn't be out in the corridor the way they often are. It should be actually at each window. Um, uh, so you need quite a sophisticated uh, monitoring and sensing system. Um, uh, and it should be three lights, not two. Green light, the building is asking you to open your window. Red light, the building is asking you to close your window. White light, the building is happy. So this is just a very primitive example of a conversation between the inhabitants of the building and the building systems and the building itself. Obviously, we already have the ability for buildings to talk back to us. We often talk now to all kinds of devices in our homes. So it's not very far away from going beyond, to be able to go beyond lighting, little lights turning on and off to actual conversations between the inhabitants and the building. Uh, the building system is represented by the operators in commercial buildings. Uh, in, in homes, it wouldn't be. There wouldn't be an operator. It would just be the house itself. But you can see that the technology is enabling, increasingly going to enable this kind of interactive adaptivity. Um, and this has all kinds of interesting performative dimensions that might connect, actually, to the content uh, of the programming of the arts, uh, St. Lawrence Center for the Arts. In the end, we achieved five of the seven goals with SIRS. We achieved two of the uh, environmental ones you can see on the left, and we achieved all three, as you've seen, of the, the social ones. This is a building built in the first decade uh, of this century and opened its doors in 2011, 11 years ago. Why are we building buildings that are not net positive? That's a question I'd like to pose to you. Why, how, how can it be the case? I mean, net zero is hard, as you've heard this morning. It's not trivial, but it's also not sufficient. Uh, and it, we can do it, um, as I've tried to suggest in a couple of other examples. And my argument is, uh, so we should. 
So I want to end with three implications for implementation of a re regenerative sustainability approach. First of all, reframing goals and aspirations towards net positive outcomes. You're not going to achieve uh, that goal if it isn't a goal, if it isn't explicit in both human and environmental terms. Secondly, achieve and sustain a participatory and integrated process over the lifetime of the activity. I haven't said much about this, but it is crucial. Taking a life cycle approach, uh, not just in terms of environmental impact, as we've heard about, but also in terms of, of, of cost. Now we, Devin said a few words about that, uh, but also in terms of the life within the building. You need this kind of deeply participatory process. You've got to engage the inhabitants throughout. You've got to engage the building operators at the design stage. So we need an integrated project delivery approach, not just an integrated design approach. And you'll hear more about that this week. And in the service of, of all of this, develop targets and metrics that guide change strategies uh, and assess net positive outcomes. So let's make it happen. Thanks very much. I'm happy to take any questions if I haven't gone on too long. John, we do have some questions in the chat here. Okay. Um, the first one uh, is from Ben Brown. Uh, he says, I may have missed it, but how does active house differ from passive house? Are they the same comfort and IAQ demands? Also a requirement of active house. For example, continuous fresh air, ventilation, uh, mean radiant temperature, air tightness, etc. Yes, active house is intended to incorporate passive house, but go beyond it uh, on the human side and uh, on the in the direction of being net positive. So, uh, of course, the the very specific detailed goals for any particular building might be slightly different, but the overall approach is to incorporate the highly retentive envelope uh, approach of passive house, but to add to it these uh, these human dimensions. Uh, and, and go beyond energy as well, as I've tried to suggest. So I see it as an extension of passive house uh, rather than as an alternative, uh, you know, or, or, or diff, uh, you know, antagonistic to passive house. Okay, great, uh, thank you. The next question is for Arnav, uh, from Arnav, and it is, do you think municipalities or local zoning body uh, bodies are open towards implementing greenhouse housing for all future projects, both residential and commercial projects? Yeah, there's a there's a huge variance, right? And what's interesting is uh, so, uh, the the uh, from where I sit, the real energy of uh, the climate change, climate action these days is not at the national level. It really is at the urban level. So it's cities uh, and you have to look at each city because they're all they all have their own rules. And uh, it, the, one of the interesting gradients we have is some of the larger cities, which typically have staff who can address these issues, have adopted the stronger targets. That's not universally the case. There's some small communities that have really gone far in this direction. But uh, in general, if we say who, where are the cities that are you know, world leaders in this, it's sort of the same list, at least in the industrialized world, uh, Vancouver, San Francisco, New York, Toronto, Copenhagen, Stockholm, Paris, London, and so on. Uh, these tend to be large cities that are really have adopted uh, net zero. That's kind of where everybody's gone. Um, so it, of, yeah, they're absolutely open to it. it. The difficulty is the challenges of jurisdiction, of, of uh, budget. Um, for example, you heard this morning, Devin said the Ontario Building Code isn't helping us at all. They just made revisions to the Ontario Building Code this year that actually it may, made no move in this direction at all. So, uh, so that's a problem. Uh, we have the problem cities have where they can't raise their own money. And certainly in Canada, they're creatures of the province. It's only property taxes. So there's limits to what they can do. But you heard from Devin and David just how much they are pushing in this direction. Smaller cities in Ontario, for example, and BC, the two I know the best, are also moving in this direction. We looked, we did a study of of 12 different municipalities in, in BC in terms of climate action, um, and they're all moving. Um, but it, it's not to say it's, it's smooth sailing. There is sometimes there's a, you get it, we found in BC a, an election, 
council changed, the mayor changed, and suddenly there was no appetite for this. So it's not just everybody's there and everybody's doing it, but increasingly, I've been doing this for many decades, and it, it, one of the things I can certainly attest to is the number of, of uh, government agencies, uh, private sector companies, uh, cities, and so on that are starting to act very actively in this has, has just gone through the roof. So I think most municipalities today, at least in Canada, um, are, are open to the idea. Some need a lot of, uh, uh, need to learn a lot to figure out how to do this. Western Europe, even more so. Other parts of the world, it varies. Uh, okay, there was a second question. How can we ensure a better air ventilation system as the traditional AC cooling uh, mechanism in residential complex has resulted in the rise in temperature? Yeah, I think we have to rethink uh, HVAC altogether. It's been a purely mechanical approach for many decades, uh, and we're starting to return back to natural ventilation and some of the uh, lessons from traditional agriculture. I remember walking along the street in, in Madrid one day and it was you know, August and about 35 degrees. And as I walked past a, a, an arched entrance into a, an interior uh, complex, a building complex, cool air was blowing out. There was no mechanical ventilation involved in that at all. Uh, that was just good design. So I think, I think there's been a paradigm shift. And I think you'll hear in the sessions this week, um, some of the, these alternative strategies. Uh, other than brute force air conditioning, um, which it has all kinds of problems with. Um, if anyone else has a question, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask it at any time. Uh, Hacken asks about the code for gamification. It's human in, in caps. Okay, I think um, that's it for our questions. Uh, thank you so much, John. It was a great presentation. Um, the next one starts at 1.30 1 and we'll see. Please remember to join through the Feedloop platform. Um, and thanks again, John. Okay, I, I look forward to seeing the presentations on Friday and what you're able to do with this massive amount of information that you're being given. Bye-bye. Thanks, John. Bye-bye.